For our final episode of Season 2, we got to speak with a legend. Ed Iskandarian made his mark at the birth of hot rodding and has been shaping its course ever since. My cam would actually pass cars on the track and work your way up to the front. It had more torque or mid-range. And that, I discovered that's by accident. And actually, I found out the industry needed me. I, I was actually needed, <laughs> much to my surprise. Iski just turned 100 years old. In the days leading up to our recording, he had traveled from Los Angeles, spent the weekend riding along in a few early hot rods through the Nebraska back roads, and that morning he toured the dyno shop to watch some early banger-powered speedsters get tested and tuned. That's an itinerary that would wear any of us out, regardless of age. Even so, Iski spent the hours before we talked to him darting around the museum like a little kid, poking around the early engines on display, pocket flashlight in hand. Iski came to visit us during the Speedster reunion at the Museum of American Speed and was kind enough to give an interview in front of a live audience. Museum curator Tim Matthews conducted the interview, and we're proud to bring you excerpts from the conversation that followed. I guess to kind of get us started, I kind of want to go all the way back to the beginning. So if it's 2021, you were born in 1921. Tell us a little bit about your, your young years. I was born on a farm in uh, Cutler, California, near Fresno. My dad had a vineyard he bought, put a down payment on, and, but he got frosted right away, uh, and there won't be a crap. So he gave up and came to Los Angeles. He was a blacksmith in the old country, but evidently uh, plenty of blacksmiths were uh, migrating at that time, and he had to sh learn the shoe repair trade. And uh, he sold uh, used and new shoes, uh, uh, mismatched shoes and stuff he'd get deals on. So anyway, he tried to get me interested in the uh, shoe sh shop, but, but I'd already discovered these uh, gal jobs that uh, we, there were two in my neighborhood. And I thought there's only two in the whole world. And we found out, no, if you want to see a lot of them, uh, come up to uh, Muroc Dry Lake several times a year. They have speed trials for top speed there. And man, that was fun to be up there because a hundred cars were in line from all different parts of California and maybe Oregon or nearby states uh, running for top speed on these dry lakes, which, are, which get a little wet and water on them in the wintertime, but they dry up and they're flat as a pancake. And the best one was Muroc Dry Lake, which the government took away from us uh, from Edwards Air Force Base. So uh, anyway, that's the way we learned. Uh, in fact, the, the day the, the army kicked us off the, off the lake was a day that I thought, since I have uh, about 11 or 13 to 1, I forget which, on my heads, I got to have a spark plug suitable. And the Kragars that had compression used the same size, 18 millimeter, and I forget the number of that plug. So I finally had the money to buy new plugs. And because uh, before this, I used the plugs you'd find behind the Ford agency, used plugs. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't want to miss on the top end that we got to go fast up there if we can. And uh, I'll try out the brand new plugs. Uh, it was a cold plug. And it worked one time. <laughs> then I put them in a box and put the junk plugs in and drove up. And uh, up there we put in those new plugs and they were way too cold. Uh, uh, for because I had a bad location for the uh, spark plug. It's supposed to be in a hot spot, we found out later, and it was in a cold spot behind the intake valve. So uh, that was a lesson. We, we almost would have had fast time up there that particular year. Uh, so anyway, uh, we learned from the older guys. That's the way I learned. 
Can you remember, Ed, any of those early guys that really had an influence on you? I will talk about Ed Winfield in a minute, Ooh, yeah. but some of those old hot rodders? Uh, well, Winfield, was, of course, was uh, unapproachable, it seemed like to us. And But finally, someone did go to see him and buy a cam and came back with uh, information, technical information. What was it? It was volumetric efficiency. Boy, that sounds good. What does that mean? <laughs> and uh, we finally realized you have to fill the cylinder all the way to get 100% volumetric efficiency. I don't know if we knew it at the time, but later we learned the higher the speed, the harder it is to fill the cylinder all the way. And then we didn't know it, but later on, you can get over 100% volumetric efficiency with certain little tricks and so forth. So uh, I finally got to beat Winfield uh, when I got a job and I had some money to buy a cam. And, uh, and uh, I had taken these, uh, I had bought for $65, I had bought some heads that would make a flathead V8 into an overhead valve V8, but it wasn't quite right. It was, uh, the intake was in the head, the exhaust was in the head to make it run cool. About three different companies had done this. And the real reason they ran hot was a bad fuel distribution, which uh, if you had six cylinder inline or eight cylinder inline, you'll, You'll see that distribution tube in the block to give it equal air, oil, or water to each cylinder. That was the real reason I understand. Well, anyway, uh, I had those, they were low compression, and I heard that high compression gives you more power. So uh, I've had them filled in, had them heated almost red hot at the welding place. Arco welding, and they filled in the combustion chambers. Now I had to grind them out, so that's why I went to Winfield uh, to order the cam. And how big should this passage be between the intake valve and the bore in order to breathe? And he knew exactly what size. He said nine tenths of a square inch. And I said, so wonder how does he know that? But anyway. <laughs> Uh, he took pity on me and sold me his uh, cam grinder he had made in about 1933. And before that, he had started by grinding the cams on his one-cylinder motorcycle all by hand, you know, which you can do, and uh, they work pretty good sometimes. So he, uh, uh, he showed me how the... I was fascinated by the machine, and uh, after the war, it was when I uh, decided I'd like to try it, and I felt like I'm taking advantage of his, uh, him helping me uh, see the machine. But no, he, he would have helped me, I found out later. Uh, so in later years, uh, I started to make money, and uh, so we decided, why are we wasting time not visiting Winfield is living in Las Vegas now on the way home from Bonneville. Why don't we stop and see him? And we did, and uh, we, we, we didn't want to wear him out talking because he would t answer anything we wanted to know. So uh, later I started visiting him uh, every six weeks or so, and... Uh, and then I'd uh, say, well, uh, that's enough for today. I'll come back tomorrow, okay? And, and later then I said, you know, I should start paying him because he's telling me all about things in the early days of racing, things that you should know. And uh, he would accept the money, and uh, he it wasn't too much or too little, I guess. So... Uh, it had to have been a, a really wonderful thing because I think you told me that when you first met 
Ed, there were a lot of people kind of kicking around his shop, and he was a busy guy, so he didn't, didn't really pay too much attention or give any of the young guys attention, but he liked you for some reason. Well, some guys wanted to go fast, and they didn't want to know all the details about uh, how the engine works or anything. Just make me a can, makes me go fast. I got to beat some somebody's got the grud race going on. So, uh, so those guys didn't get much attention. They just put their cam through the door and come back with the money and go. <laughs> but if you were building something funny or special, uh, he would be glad to look at it and help you and tell you what you might be doing wrong and, or, you know, he would, he would help you. So this is glad a, to help you. This is a picture of our friend Ed. And uh, so would have you come in that back door right to the, to the right-hand yeah, side of that uh, picture? That's the machine he had built and uh, about 1933. Uh, you buy a regular uh, cylindrical grinder. In this case, it was an internal grinder he converted. And he did all the off cams and stuff on there. Well, after the, when the war started, he had so many orders, after the war this is, he had so many orders, uh, he couldn't fill them. This machine wasn't fast enough, so he bought a, a, a brand new machine from Landis for about $15,000 that ran automatically, and it's the same cam, the same grinder the, cam, the factory uses to make cams. And it would make a cam maybe in about three or four minutes. But, but he had to make the big master cam for it, which he was able to do. And so he uh, was able to sell a lot of cams back east here in the Midwest and back east. Uh, he filled the, filled the bill order out with that machine. Well, later the flathead slowed down and uh, the factory knew that that machine had very little use, and by God, he sold it back to the factory for uh, $12,000. Hmm. Got almost all his money. The prices had gone up in the meantime. You know, we're so proud to have your car here. Uh, it's just such an honor. Here it is. Tell us a little bit about the, the history of the car. Uh, it started out with your friend, Mr. Ethan. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. We... Uh, we uh, walked home from school together, and I found out his brothers had a Model T, and and he taught me the firing order, one, two, four, three. And I thought, gee, I'll remember that, but why isn't it one, two, three, four? But I'll find that out later. <laughs> so little by little, I learned about the Model Ts, and uh, that was simple. And you could buy one for uh, 5 or $10 and uh, drag it home and... The older, older guys would help us uh, get it running, you know, and teach us, you know. Now that, this uh, Model T, John Athen, my friend, bought it from uh, our Swedish friends, uh, and it had a, had a Rajo a Model T engine in it, that, that frame of this, the frame. And it had a Franklin axle with elliptic springs in front, and then John had, Converted to a 32 Ford front axle with brakes, with front wheel brakes for the first time. Well, uh, finally, uh, the Model Ts, uh, I gave up on the Model Ts, and because uh, you could now go to the wrecking yard, and I bought a late 36 VA engine for $65 with cracked valve seats. Now, that'll be okay. It looked like a racing engine to me. And the bike guy, they never leaked or anything. And uh, now we had a pretty fast car uh, for a day, yeah. <laughs> well, I bought that from John. He blew up the engine. The flywheel uh, came off the back of the crank, and <laughs> he sold that. And I bought that, and that's how I got started with this, with uh, putting that V8 engine there. I love that when you tell the story that he may be the first guy that put a 29 body on a 32 frame. Uh-huh, that's right. Now, money was really tight, and if a guy wanted to build an AV8, 
you go, you get that cross member out of a 32 frame, dig it to John, five bucks, he would saw it and bolt it into your frame. He didn't have a welder, but you all hacksaw it, and that would give you a rear motor mount for your V8 and the Model A, and then the front wasn't too hard to take out. So he'd done several of those for five bucks a piece. Now he's got the money to buy his own, build his own AVA. And he goes to the wrecking yard, and the wrecking man said, well, but, uh, it's 10 bucks. You can take the whole frame or saw it out yourself. Well, I'll, I better take the whole frame. I'll do a better job of sawing it out at home. And he took it home and he sets it down. Maybe before we go a little further, let's see if the body will fit on that frame. <laughs> Gee, it's almost a perfect fit. There's a little bit of kick up on the frame and, and if you want it cheaper, you put a garden hose in there to fill in this space. But he wanted to do it even faster. He took that cowl area there and he went from a quarter inch to zero and let it fit all the way down flat. He might have been the first to do the uh, the 29 body on the model on the on the, on the 32 frame. Yeah. Oh boy. How old would have you been when you met John? Huh? How old would have you been when you met John? Well, it was grammar school. Grammar school. Wow. Yeah, it was grammar school, and the reason we got to be friends was because my best friend in school, Tommy Jimmy Pearson who was uh, good in drafting too, like John. When it was time to go home, he went the same direction I went. And, I, and, and John and him were like brothers because they lived together. John's mother worked in a restaurant and so did Jimmy Pearson's mother. And so they boarded, so Miss, she boarded Jimmy with John. <laughs> so, she play, uh, so they lived together, they were like brothers. In hindsight, America's post-war obsession with hot rodding makes sense. But did Iskey, who was there from the very beginning, have any inkling of how the American automotive future was about to change forever? Yeah, I think before the war, it would be hard to make a living making speed parts. Uh, but after the war, the money loosened really, really loosened up during the war and after the war. And uh, my ambition was to make five cams a day at $20 a piece labor on a, those V8 flathead cams. And after about a year, I was making $100 a day labor, yeah. <laughs> and uh, by golly, I, uh, Hot Rod Magazine got started. Uh, before that, we had no communication at all. And uh, uh, by golly, at the, uh, and I went partners with Anson, who was Jack Andrews, our old mentor uh, from the old Model T days, and the Louis Center, Louis Center. Before you put the maxi heads on, did you switch it over to a 32 motor at that time? Oh, oh well, and then, well, a funny thing, there was no overhead valve V8s, although Chevrolet, had built one back in 1916 or somewhere. And so we heard about these heads for sale made by Maxi, M-A-X-I. And uh, his name was Rex A. Head, and he, would, he was in charge of uh, parking cars underground garage downtown LA. And he uh, sold those heads for $65. Oh, we were excited, uh, and we we heard high compression is going to help. So, we heard uh, uh, about uh, milling and filling heads and stuff like that. And um, after the convention chambers were filled with cast iron while they were real red hot, I, I really uh, uh, Winfield told me how big to make the passage between the uh, intake valve and the cylinder board so that 
you'd get poor breathing. And uh, so, so, and he showed me his machine, which fascinated me. And this picture, Ed, uh, is that you guys getting ready for the maxi oh, yeah. heads right there? Uh, now I had to plug the old exhaust ports, and uh, I thought, gee, maybe I can pour lead into the old exhaust ports, and the push rod's going to come through there to, to operate that exhaust valve. And by golly, uh, uh, we turned so we turned the car on an angle like that, so that so that so that. The heads were flat now, and then when I uh, when it cooled, by God, they shrunk and they were loose. But that found out by hitting them with a hammer, they swelled up again. <laughs> and you know, I needed a special head gasket, but I used the flat head gasket and bought some material that's like gasket material, and it filled in the old spot, and it worked pretty good for a while. Uh, Later on, uh, we we had trouble, but anyway, uh, so we decided here to let's really while it's on an angle like this, let's really make believe it an accident. <laughs> so uh, that kid there turned out to be Herman. There turned out to be a diesel uh, man uh, working for the big diesel companies and stuff, and uh, that's my brother Luther on there. Uh, sleeping in there. <laughs> so uh, that was just a joke deal. <laughs> your maxi head hot rod, it, it went pretty fast at the dry lakes. What was your top speed out oh, uh, there? Well, this one with those maxi heads uh, went 120 finally up there before the war. And uh, I don't think they were any better than flathead, to tell you the truth, because uh, <laughs> that exhaust is not, I found out the exhaust is not important. Don't worry about the exhaust getting out. You don't have to have uh, more lot, more timing on your exhaust or all that stuff. It gets out. And I, and I, like Winfield, I told him one day, you know, on the dyno, we found that a small block Chevy, uh, they're uh, headers, but they they come together for four inches. And, but in, and if we run it that way and don't put a 20, inch extension on there, we lost 10 or 15 or 20 horsepower. Yes, you always need a little back pressure. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think we're calling it back pressure uh, for simplicity, but it's evidently a lot more com complicated than that. But uh, in a lot of cases, you'll find that uh, uh, the neighbors complain about the noise at the racetrack and they have to put on mufflers, and they go faster <laughs> sometimes. Even the cam father had to start somewhere. And back in his day, information on cam grinding was scarce. So how did Iski figure it all out? I built that machine uh, after the war because uh, I put my sh apprentice machinery, my sh apprentice uh, machines pop experience. And I got to make the master cam to try out the machine. So I look in the book, and it says you have to have a clearance ramp. And I'm going to leave that off, because I just want to make the machine run. I, I want to see it run to work and go back and forth. And uh, uh, so I made a fast action cam. And by golly, uh, a kid in the neighborhood was building his first V8. And I had built something before, so I helped him, and he bought a cam. And when he got it running, I could hear it coming from a half a block away, the tap it noise. Boy, I was ashamed of that. But it's the only cam I had right now, but I'm, I'm trying to sell them. If you went to a speed shop to try and sell your cams, you couldn't know anything about cams because you're just a kid that races at the dry lakes. You couldn't know anything about cams. It's, it seemed like you had to have a reputation. But, but ants in there, they, they were, they were and bold. They would sell them anyway. And, uh, and I didn't know. I had, and I had some, but I didn't know it. So uh, I had that noisy. Don't forget that was noisy. But it gave me, on a flathead, that really works good. 
And uh, so a guy was building a boat called Scheme and Demon, a flathead, flat bottom boat. And uh, I think I gave him the cam free. And when uh, Jack Andrews got it running, he was hitting the throttle and the drive shaft disconnected and it's got a light fly reel and stuff. And he's goosing it and running it. And it's peppy, you know. And, oh, this thing's really hot. My cam is in there. And my <laughs> cam is good. You like, really? Can you really <laughs> tell? Uh, it's in neutral and uh, it, it, there's no drive shaft, no weight. But he, he knew flatheads because that's what he was running now. And, uh, and then NASCAR called. And it wasn't the hottest team or the most experienced team in NASCAR. They're running flathead Ford V8s, and the bodies are usually 37, 38-year uh, flatheads. And they're running on dirt tracks. And uh, they called in heard if they went to California and bought a cam uh, that would help them go faster. And they didn't know the simple terms we had of semi, three quarter, full, and super. And then that's when I called the track guy because it was so noisy. It was only good for the track. <laughs> so, uh, so they, uh, they called up and bought two cams by airmail at 20 bucks a piece. And I says, do you want those on good used cores, which are $2 a piece? Oh, no, we want new cores. Well, they're $7 a piece new. Oh, that's what we want. Oh, boy, these are high rollers uh, about here, back here. <laughs> and you know, they, uh, this was not a hot team uh, with a lot of experience, but evidently they went better than they ever went before. And some of the other, Teams found out what the, where they had got the cam, and and I got more orders, and 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 later on Bob Osiki came from back east here, and he told me why they were ordering. My cam would actually pass cars on the track and work your way up to the front. It had more torque or mid range, and that, I discovered that's by accident. And then, so the, and actually I found out the industry needed me. I, I was actually needed, <laughs> much to my surprise, because all I wanted to do was make $100 a day. <laughs> and, uh, oh, then, uh, then the funny thing is that your customers give you some pretty good ideas sometimes. So later on, I meet Scotty Finn, who's a, he a real good uh, body man, I mean, a fabricator. And he came out from Oklahoma and started his feed shop. And he says that he taught Jocko, who was a famous port grinder, how to port cams. And I didn't know if he really, if that was really true or not. But anyway, he'd come down at night to talk and he, he had built this chassis for a drag racing car, top fuel. And uh, Yeagle Brothers Cadillac, they'd put their, one of their Cadillacs in there. Went pretty good. And then and the, uh, Nick Arias put a, put a Buick, uh, no, not a Buick, a GMC six-cylinder overhead valve, a cab, valve engine. It went pretty good, but not really outstanding. So... Uh, he got a little disgusted and said, I'm going back to Oklahoma. And I said, well, give me your address and I'll write to you, maybe once in a while. Uh, by the way, when he came, he talked with authority, by the way. And he had a cigarette that would hang on the bottom lip and still stay lit. And when he wanted to take a puff, he could flip it up and puff it and let it hang again. It was wonderful. <laughs> and uh, he talked with authority, and you, you couldn't help but listen to him talk about hot rods and his ideas and all that thing, of what he found fault with, with how Wally Parsh was running NHRA. So um, 
Isky, why don't you make a five cycle cam? You know, I had heard of a five cycle washing machine, <laughs> but I never associated that with the engine. But now it's, he's associated with the four cycle engine. And I'm thinking, gee, that sounds so good. God, you could be famous. How could you add a cycle to the engine? And, and gee, I'm going to hold on to that now. How, if you ever use that term, how could you substantiate it? And I said, well, it would have to be the overlap period. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. We'll have to screws in right after power, exhaust. Well, or is it between the intake and the exhaust? I, anyway, it's the overlap period. So I held on to it until the right time. And finally it came. Bedwell bought the, that car from Scotty, modified it a little. Cook, Cook was the driver, had just uh, lost his ride with one of the Speed Sport special cars, uh, which were very fast, the rear engine roadsters, you know. And they were on the right track because all they had to do was extend the wheelbase <laughs> out further, and, and that was the new dragsters. By golly, they don't have money, and they have to use carburetors instead of fuel injection. So uh, Carb made the, the, fab, the, the uh, fabricated, uh, you, you weld them yourself. You buy two. Well, first one don't, it gets warped too bad. You have to make another one. Yeah. And so uh, with eight carburetors. Well, those carburetors, that venturi in those carburetors feeds almost a proper amount of fuel at all different velocities and airflow. Almost perfect. You know, that's why it works so good. Uh, but if the but, but Hillborn's fuel injection worked good at wide open and maybe at idle, and in between it wouldn't wasn't perfect. But they had ways of getting around that with bypasses and this and that, and tricky ways of doing. So how did you go with your uh, dragster with the Hillborn injection? It's a Chrysler. Well, it blubbered off the line and was glitch, but boy, it's cleaned out almost at the end of the track and really pulled hard. What are you gonna do next time, run? Well, we're gonna lead it down. And then you'd come by uh, an hour or two later, and how'd they do when you leaned it down? Oh, uh, oh, it pulled real good. Oh, we burned pistons on the top end. I said, well, <laughs> you're gonna have to have two bypasses and switch from one to the other maybe. And that, they invented that later there. They did to have that. And so, uh, so Cook, Cook and Bedwell. Now, it was lucky that Cook is married to Joaquin Arnett, Nett's sister. And he can find out everything about Nitro from Joaquin Arnett, the bean bandits, the head of the bean bandits. How did he learn? Well, he was in the Navy and they had a fire in the gun turret, and he had to go to the hospital, and the next door bed was uh, one of the guys that built, made those little engines that run on nitro for model airplanes, and he taught them about nitro, and he did plenty of experimenting himself, and pretty good, they couldn't be beat. <laughs> At Bakersfield, three years in a row, they won top fuel uh, eliminator, uh, the bean manage. So uh, Cook is out of a job. Now they've got this car, and they come and got a free cam, which they could, because I all the cam grinders needed good, fast, top fuel cars. Some somebody's going to have a combination that's going to be fast. Somebody's going to have the talent to do it just right. Well, by golly. Because they didn't have money for fuel injection, and they had to run eight carburetors, and they had to pump up 10 pounds of pressure, which is evidently 
at the top end was overcoming the float and needle and just flooding it. And they was sucking it all in, and it needed it all, too. It liked it all, the nitro, and went faster. And they went 11 miles an hour faster and set a new record. And I said, well, that, that's the five cycle. And it looked like I really did have something, but it was really the carburetors that did the job. <laughs> you were obviously uh, one of the first people to really uh, get involved with advertising your logo. Uh, oh, the yeah. t- the T-shirt thing was a big deal. Oh, but yeah. But then later with Don Garwitz, too, and, and kind of what you did with him. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, that's All just right, kind of some genius. Well, the uh, the first Bonneville is going to take place at uh, Wendover, Utah, where John Cobb is at his records, over 400 mile an hour. So D- Norm Lane and Doug Harrison, we're going to go to the first one. Uh, Wally Parks and Pete are putting it on, NHRA. And uh, I give them $100 tow money. Uh, and they stopped at Las Vegas and claimed they, they made a little more money. They had moved. I don't know if it's true or not. <laughs> and they said, we're going to dress up the crew a little bit. We're using your cam. And uh, they the, uh, went pretty good, about 100 miles an hour. And they came home. Uh, uh, you're going to dress up the crew? What are you going to use? I don't know. We'll think of something. And they came back with a T-shirt with my logo about four inches of diameter. What, where did you have this made? We had it made in Hollywood, and he gave me the address, and so we started, we went up there and we had it made much bigger, and we gave him away at Bonneville, uh, at, to the entrance for a while, and we sold some too. And some people think we invented uh, advertising on t-shirts. Someone might have done it before us, but it, it seemed like we might, we were in at the beginning anyway. Uh, putting silk screen uh, uh, information on t-shirts. Iskey wasn't the only hot rodder making cams. Sure enough, he found himself in the middle of an all-out advertising war. Ads appeared in Hot Rod magazine poking fun at the competition, and a reply would appear the next month. This back and forth became known as the Cam Wars, and we asked Ed how that all got started. Uh, Well, it started because uh, there was competition uh, I guess one of us, one of us has started bragging, and then, uh, and maybe they'd win uh, a race and say they had the best of everything, and pretty soon, uh, so others decided they'd be able to advertise if they've got some winning wins, you know, and stuff, and uh, and and uh, like one of our. Stiffest competitors was Howard Johansson. He used his front name at, for his can company instead of his back name. He should have used his back name because Johansson is a famous uh, Swiss company that makes Joe Blocks, their precision Joe Blocks. Anyway, um, so I went to his funeral service and they told me. Oh, he thought uh, this was great for business, the way we were having wars and fights back and forth. Oh, I thought he was mad at me. No, he thought this was great uh, for business and stuff. Oh, if I would have known that, I said, I would have come over and visited, and I'll let him get the best of me this week, and then I'll get the best of him next week, and back and we'll orchestrate it a little bit and have fun back and forth. But uh... Iski, uh, one thing Joe and I have in common, my friend over here, is we both worked on the telephones at Speedway Motors, and you know we had to sell parts and, and answer questions about parts and how they're supposed to work. And I'm looking at this picture of you here at your desk, and you're on the phone, and somebody asked you uh, yesterday, how'd you start smoking cigars? Oh, yeah. And- well, remember, at that time, it was $3 to make a call for... New York to California. So the guys that wanted to order pistons, while they ordered a cam from me, would you mind relaying this order for Jan's pistons? 
and and pretty soon I'd have two or three of those that do it, and I'm getting nervous. I got to get that phone call in the day before it gets dark. Oh my goodness, and I'd get nervous. And so at lunch, they had cigars for 25 cents. Boy, they were good cigars. You can't get those anymore. And I, by golly, that calmed me down. I. I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to start drinking, but that calmed me down, and it really did. It helped, and and that's the way I'd be busy like that, uh, giving advice to the new the new guys, like guys that could teach you something later on too. <laughs> <laughs> and some, so that's the way it was. Uh, a new thing. There are not enough experts. Uh, there's there's not a lot of experts yet in this. Especially the speeds and, and accomplishments are getting pretty good in hot riding. And there's no one that know, not many people that know. It's a it's a new thing, yeah. You, so you can you can do a little bluffing too sometimes, <laughs> yeah. You've heard Tim and Ed reference some photos throughout the interview. To see those and a few more, visit the toolbox, our automotive blog. Find it at speedwaymotors.com by clicking the toolbox link on the front page. We'll also post a few to Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for listening to What Moves You, and if you like what you hear, tell a friend to find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Well, you know, I, I don't want to go too much longer, but before you know, we kind of start wrapping up, I wanted to talk a little bit about your car being here in Nebraska and having it here at the Museum of American Speed. You know, your relationship with us goes back quite a long way, and I remember your first visit to the museum here. That would have been, what, about seven, six or seven years ago uh, that you visited the museum with Doug yeah, the last time? Yeah, that's right, yeah. And... Uh, what what what's your takeaway of the museum? You know, it obviously means a oh, lot to us. Oh, it's wonderful. I I just can't believe the things I'll never would have got to see if I hadn't uh, if you had, if Bill hadn't collected these things uh, and went out of his way to get them. Boy, uh, uh, do you remember dealing with Bill Smith back in the early days when Bill was getting his speed shop started? Would have been about. 52 or 53? I, I, I know he came along, but I didn't really know how big it was getting and how big a deal it was. Yeah. And I'd meet him at these uh, SEMA shows and PRI shows. And and I got a wonderful picture where uh, you guys sent me Carol Shelby and Bill Smith <laughs> and me. And my head's in the picture, too. I couldn't yeah, believe well, it. You know, we, we took some time before we cleaned out Bill's office, and that picture was on Bill's desk, and Clay Smith brought it over, and he said, you just got to send this to Iski. I bet he'll really like it. And I sure enough, did. it was... I couldn't uh, believe it existed. There yeah. you were. And, you know, so, you know, the very first thing that we talked to you about was was Ed Winfield's cam grinder, which you you were smart enough to to get uh, the cam grinder that was in the picture, and and yeah. was that after Ed had passed away that that you were able to get that? Was that at his uh, sale that they yeah. sold that? Yeah. Well, uh, now we were visit I was visiting uh, Winfield as often as I could, and he started to tell me he's uh, not feeling that well, and he starts to treat himself by reading books about medical. And um, he won't go to a doctor, uh, but if a doctor will come to his office, to his place, it's okay. So uh, I couldn't find a doctor like that. Now, Louis Center's brother was a doctor, and he couldn't make it either. In fact, he was a racetrack doctor. Uh, He'd be at the racetracks always. So uh, finally, I couldn't get a hold of him, and I started calling the hospitals, and I found him nearby. And uh, I went to visit, and it was something about water on the legs or something. And I didn't think it was serious, but the doctor seemed to think it was serious. And uh, that... uh, so by golly, two days later, he passed away. Mm. A couple of days later, and I, I was surprised. So I, I told the attorney, 
I'd like to buy the uh, shop, the whole shop, the little shop they had built behind the house, nice little building. And he said, well, we'll have to uh, advertise this and access uh, everything. And they hired a man that saw that was all older equipment, but he didn't know the, the, the value uh, of it, uh, how uh, important it was. And he, he, he said it was worth $700 a shop. Hmm. And then one day I'm talking to the lawyer, how's it coming? When can I get the stuff? And uh, well, uh, some people think it was only worth $700, but we we found out, it's, but now we know it's worth $20,000. I said, where'd you get that figure? Because they were almost going to give it away. Hmm. They didn't think it was worth anything. He says, you gave it to us, don't you remember? <laughs> I said, gee, that's a good thing I said that, or they might have given it away. Wow. Uh, and so when I did go to buy it, it was finally all set to buy, had been advertised and all that. Oh, there's someone here that raised the bid to 21,000. Do you want to raise your bid? And I said, if I go 22, He'll go 23. <laughs> I said, I better, Jake, I, I said, I'll have to go 25, I'll go. And then he, I waited. Okay, you got it. It was Ferguson. Oh. <laughs> he wanted <laughs> Great uh, guy, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> he loves the same stuff you love. Yeah, yes. he, he loves that stuff too. <laughs> he was a good friend too with Brent Peel. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I found out later. And what an honor it is to have that cam grinder here. I remember the day it arrived, and, and everyone you take on a tour, when you tell them whose cam grinder that is, and you show them the box of masters, you know, that, that stuff, if it could talk, right? I mean, it's just such historic uh, yeah. stuff. I and mean, just thank you uh, from all of us here at the museum for, uh, for kind of taking that first step of, of putting it in front of people and putting it in front of our visitors uh, so they can learn about Mr. Winfield. I think that's been so important. And then to take the next step and then to have your car here so we can tell your story. And, and uh, you know, I know I speak for everyone to, to say I've it's got, great. I've got a letter i got to say. Send you. It's from a famous race driver of the old days. I can't think of which, which, which famous race driver. And he writes in a letter to Winfield, I don't want, I want kind of soft actions. I don't want valve float. And well, he's, Winfield, that's the way he made him. He, he they would wear way high because he had gentle, very gentle cams and, and he would ne never have any valve float. And he, he, he's asking him to make these cams this way. That's his specialty. Yes, that's really his specialty. Ed, is there any parting words you would say to our crowd? Uh, any uh, words of wisdom or things about you that maybe they don't already know about well, you? Well, uh, I'm lucky I found this hobby, which is so much fun, and such wonderful people are into these cars. They must have been in horse and buggies in the old days. Uh, I, and we got to look into that and see if the horse and buggy guys had meetings together like this. <laughs> they must have because uh, they would love their horse or would love their, and they would dress up their buggies, something like the Rose Parade. But the thing uh, the, that was great about it is you learn from the older fellas uh, and they're always, you seem to be glad to help you. And pretty soon you can help the new guys after you've learned a little bit. And uh, I kind of thought it over one time. I said, you know, some of the guys you might help when they don't know anything, but they got talent. They might go, uh, go far in this uh, uh, business or uh, hobby. Uh, uh, in the future, you know, so it, uh, so you don't have, and I noticed uh, you, in the beginning, uh, it's good to learn as you go along, and, and you might stumble on to something good. <laughs> Thank you.
It was an absolute honor and a great privilege to get to meet Iski and hear a few of his stories firsthand. Thank you to Ed Iskandarian for joining us to close out season two of What Moves You, a Speedway Motors podcast. To see photos and watch video we referenced in today's episode, visit the toolbox at speedwaymotors.com. Email the podcast at podcast at speedwaymotors.com. And if you like what you heard, tell a friend where to find us. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next season.